Oi, oi, it's your boy. The butt dragging, Musassi slagging, connection lagging, gently bragging, Jack Slack, and it's the Jack Slack podcast. Um, we're coming back for the new year. Here we are. And it's the anniversary of becoming the Jack Slack podcast because this time last year, the very first Jack Slack podcast was the Slacky Awards 2020. For the newbies, we have been podcasting forever. It was the Fights Gone By podcast that changed the name because everyone kept going, what's the name of Jack Slack's podcast? <laughs> so now we're the Jack Slack podcast. Um, got some awards to do today. Used to do a big article that I'd write for Fightland, uh, which was always good fun. But uh, nowadays we do them by podcast and it worked well last year. So I'm doing it again this year. I had you shout out all your nominations. I tried to throw throw in some extras from things I remember. The problem, you know, the problem is if you've got a good performance on an undercard or like a weird um, piece of fight IQ on, a, on an undercard, tends to pale in comparison to doing it in the main event. <laughs> so a lot of the, you know, a lot of the nominations people gave me are repeats, but I think I got most of them down, and we're going to talk through them today. So if you're not familiar with the Slacky Awards, I don't do fucking knockout of the year, uh, submission of the year, fighter of the year, which is Charles Oliveira or suck my dick. Um, I don't do any of that loser shit. I have four awards. I used to have five and I, I didn't even like the fifth award. So I took that out. That was best event. But now we do four awards, which are game plan of the year, technical turnaround for most improved fighter, breakout technique of the year, and the but why award for piss poor fight IQ. We're going to go through them one by one, and I'll read out the previous winners, the nominations and things like that, and and just sort of like what I'm looking for when I'm um, judging these and uh, coming to my decision, because this is, you know, it's just my decision. These are my awards. I'm, you know, (laughs) whenever you do awards, certainly when I see other other people in other sites do awards, it does upset people. Um, This is just me and things I value. I'm not going to take away from anyone else by saying like, you know, their, their performance wasn't what I look for in that particular award, um, except Kamaru Usman for Fighter of the Year because it's obviously Charles Oliveira or Suck My Dick. Anyway, game plan of the year. To give you an idea of the history of this award, um, 2014, first year we did it, John Jones versus Glover Teixeira, beautiful infighting, beautiful shutting off um, Teixeira's, well, shutting down Teixeira's power, crowding him, fighting him out of range. Just a great all-round performance with a great deal of effective infighting, and we haven't really seen infighting like that in MMA since. 2015, Rafael dos Anjos versus Anthony Pettis, another pressure-heavy performance, much actually more pressure-heavy than um, Jones versus Teixeira. Just inscrutable pressure uh, made Anthony Pettis wilt and battered him. 2016, Cody Garbrandt versus Dominic Cruz, for obvious reasons. I wrote a piece called um, Absolute... Masterclass, Garbrandt versus Cruz, which is on the Fight Primer. You can go check that out if you're a Patreon boy. 2017 was um, Rose Namajunas versus uh, Yoani and Jacek 1, which skirts my sort of like general rules for uh, this this award. I like to, I like a fight to play out longer than like, you know, uh, a, a one minute knockout. I, I struggle to give um, game plan of the year. But, you know, she knocked her down three times. She did it the same way several times. It was, it was pretty it was pretty convincing. And I particularly like the way she drew out kicks, punished them, the way she covered distance very quickly, used the bounce to hide the left hook. Uh, it's, it's the same thing that Yohan and Jacek had with, sorry, uh, it's the same thing that Rose Nam Yunus had with Weili Zhang. She does so much better the first time around against everyone she fights because the, the speed she covers that distance in the outside game is... Um, it, it it catches it catches bitches by surprise. If I'm honest, um, the longer fights, like her second one against Whaley this year, and um, the second one against Yanni and Jacek, she can't keep up the outside bouncing stuff through the full five rounds. So she comes down off the balls of her feet. She stands she stands more heavy on the front foot. She starts using like right hand leads, a bit of head movement, counter punching and stuff. Um, and she's good enough to win fights like that, but it's it's not as devastating as that outside work she did. And then 2018 was um, Leon, Leon, uh, Leon Edwards versus Donald Cerrone. Beautiful uh, clinch striking clinic. Outside striking clinic. It was basically knowing that Donald Cerrone, as a welterweight, when he can't win the striking, he ducks in for a cumbersome takedown attempt. Uh, and Edwards just kept stifling him there, beating, up, beating, him, 
get into the head post, beating him up with knees and elbows. Elbows on every break. It was a lovely performance. 2019, no award, because they only did technical turnaround. We'll get into that later. And 2020, last year, I awarded it to Max Holloway versus Volkanovski 2, which pissed some people off because, you know, that was a fight that was very close. People felt both sides of the decision. And a lot of people were like, you can't give game plan of the year to a losing fighter. And I, I think, yes, I can. I did and I did. The change between the first fight and the second fight was exactly what was called for. Um, the success he had in the second fight was considerably greater because of it. And you could argue he won it. But mainly it was the switch from boxing in to uh, fighting light on the lead leg, kicking and then entering with punches afterwards. And making Volkanovski come to him and countering him with uppercuts and things like that. It was, it was a lovely performance. You know, I don't... I, if you're still angry about it, suck my dick, as I said. So this year, nominations from the Twitter thread. Plus nominations that I've added, but... Um, Oliveira versus Poirier. Very popular one. Obviously fresh in the mind. Little bit tricky. Because we, as humans, tend to weight the um, most recent thing we saw as the best. Uh, I, I remember I did these last year like the day after Kyoji Horiguchi battered Kai Asakura. And I've deliberately made myself not give him game plan of the year, even though at the time I was like, that was the best performance of the year. And then a little bit of distance, I was like, actually, all he really did was low kick him. <laughs> um, but Oliveira versus Poria, very sound for a couple of reasons. Beautiful use of the wrestling when he could, went to it, uh, you know, didn't didn't wait on Poria to throw and then try and duck in on his hips or anything like that. He, he forced the wrestling on him at several points, uh, but mainly it was the body work. Beautiful front kicks to the body, beautiful um, stepping knees to the body. And the confidence to do that comes from the fact that he will, if the guy takes him down, he can just um, attack and fight his way up. And that's important because I, I have Poria on this list also for the um, second McGregor fight, which was back in January. I know it feels like forever ago, but that was in fact the year we're talking about. Uh, and in that fight, Poria used his strikes to set up, a, you know, he did the Poria shift straight into a level change underneath Conor McGregor's counter and got the takedown like in minute one of round one. And that's something you can't comfortably do to Charles Oliveira. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, very hard to just like reactive double him or trick him and get a quick double and be like, cool, I'm going to ride out the rest of the round on top now, which is something you can do to Conor McGregor. I mean, Conor McGregor is on our but wise, which we'll get into later for jumping a guillotine and ending up under Dustin Poirier for a while in the rematch. But Oliveira versus Poirier, beautiful game plan. I thought, you know, it, it is sort of the game plan that he uses for everyone. Go forward, kick the body, uh, fluster people, make them shoot onto a, a, a bad uh, single leg or double leg and grab the neck, or get takedowns by pushing them to the fence and using the clinch and trying to get on the back. But definitely worth consideration. Uh, lots of people suggested um, Jan Blachowicz versus uh, Israel Alessania. Um, and that's, again, another tricky one, which is how much do you give... Um, well, I, I tend to give a lot of weight to instances where I feel like a fighter has fought differently to what they usually do. Um, and you get a lot of, especially people nominating for this category, I get a lot of uh, fights where I look at it and go, mm, that's really just like their styles matching up in that way. You know, a guy who does A versus a guy who does B, that's a perfect uh, rock, paper, scissors. He's going to smash him every time. Whereas the best game plans tend to be like that, that guy who does B doing something different and, and winning in a way that he doesn't normally. Or those are the most, you know, certainly the most um, notable game plans for yours truly. But Jan's thing is being awkward. Um, you know, he's known for the power, doesn't have an awful lot of knockouts, but really he's just sort of awkward with his timing, his swings. And it, the whole fight, he was reaching for Adesanya's feints and not getting punished for it. You know, it's, it's quite incredible that he uh, fights in this way. Where you're, I remember looking at it before the fight and going, damn, he reaches a lot. And then Israel couldn't really uh, capitalize on it. And then the, the well-spiced-in takedowns uh, really pulled him ahead and won in the fight. I mean, I don't want to say it was a bad performance. I think it was a, a good performance. I thought it was a smart performance, a good game plan. I just don't know if it's my game plan of the year because it is. it was just sort of like the two of those doing their, their usual thing and matching up in that way. Similarly, uh, I saw a couple of suggestions for Glover Teixeira versus Jan. But that is, again... You know, Glover Teixeira doing the, the one thing that he's always done. Overhand, uh, you know, cross counters uh, and changing levels for short takedowns. <laughs> that was, that was his game. Uh, smashing people from the top of closed guard. Not really the sort of thing we're looking for. Uh, someone said Clay Guida and Anthony Hernandez for gassing out BJJ guys. Nah. 
Poirier versus McGregor 2. Um, yeah, I, I at the time thought that was a great performance by Poirier. Beautiful use of the calf kick against a guy who supposedly had never seen a calf kick before because he'd been out for two years. Um, lovely takedowns mixed in with his shifts. You know, the, the shift into level change to open the fight was just such a gorgeous decision because... The whole thing with the shift is that, or the Poria shift, is that you're stepping in, you know, it's southpaw versus southpaw, but the moment you start stepping through, you're presenting that open side counter that Conor McGregor has made a career off. And what he did was he uh, stepped through as if to do that, and then instead ducked under the counter and got the level change and uh, took him down. Beautiful counter hooks. Um, the lead hook was a huge deal for him in that fight, Poria, jabbing, pulling, counter hooking. And you saw that in the third match too, just lovely, specifically against a southpaw counterboxing. The right hook especially, you know, you don't see an awful lot of leaning back right hooks from um, Poirier because he's often fighting orthodox opponents, but Conor McGregor is especially um, there for it. If you watch his fights with other southpaws like um, Nate Diaz, the, the way he throws the left hand against orthodox fighters, he gets away with it. Against southpaw fighters... He leans so heavily onto his lead foot uh, and he, he doesn't close the door ever. You know, it's, it's always just the big left hand. And if you've been the second to pull the trigger and you've pulled away from their punch and you've thrown yours over the top, that's great. But if they're in position to hit you back or leading away as you do it, um, they're going to crack you while you're out of position. That's what happened a lot in both the first and second fights. Uh, sorry, second and third fights. Second fight, he hits him with it right off the bat, jab, pull, counter right hook. And then the, the stoppage comes after he stuns McGregor with the counter right hook along the fence. McGregor puts his back on the fence and uh, Poirier swarms on him. And a lot of people ignored that because they were like, oh, the leg's done. But it was the counter right hook that did most of it. Though, you know, the, the calf kicks were, of course, extremely important. Just a lovely game plan, is what I'm saying. Um, lots of people suggesting Aldo versus Fontenelle versus Munoz. Great fights, great technical showings. Aldo versus Munoz was just Aldo being Aldo, his usual game, uh, except having to work a bit more. You know, it, it does hammer home how low activity Aldo is a lot of the time, that that was like his easily his most active performance strike-wise, and it was a three-rounder. You know, this dude's been in title fights his whole career and never put out more strikes than that, and it wasn't a particularly torrid pace, that fight, either. Um, and the Aldo Font fight, I'm not going to give that game plan of the year. You know, I'd never consider giving that game plan of the year because the game plan was to hit him really, really hard and hope that a big connection every round was enough to balance out Font um, putting out more volume and landing more blows. And it did happen to be, but it's not going to be a lot of the time. Lots of suggestions for Mourinho versus Figgy. Um, the second... Fuck, is that the second or third? The second bout they had this year, sorry. Um, and I think, yeah, it was it was a good performance. I'm, I'm going to talk about Moreno more in um, technical turnaround because I thought he looked phenomenal. The difference between the first... I'm going to have to check this now because I'm, I'm giving myself um, doubts. No, they've only fought twice, sorry. Um, but the difference between the second fight... Sorry, the first fight and the second fight was night and day. The confidence that he oozed. You know, the confidence he was going to the um, boxing with. The, the first fight, you were like, yeah, Moreno's hands look decent. Well, actually, fuck, we'll get into this in a minute. We'll talk about that in technical turnaround. Um... I don't know if I give it my game plan of the year. I thought he was just all round looking better the second time round. The confidence really helped him. Um, but yeah, definitely up there. Um, someone said Bilal. I presume against Wonderboy. Nah. Another case of, of doing the same thing, you know, <laughs> as usual. Um, Garn versus Lewis, someone said. Everything was perfection. I mean, you've got you to shout it out. Um, I thought he did a great job of, you know, because his again, his whole game is hitting and not getting hit, being elusive. I thought he did a good job of um, picking when to push his, his uh, advantages because that's the very hard thing with Derek Lewis. The moment you hang around too long, that's when he's going to belt you with a, with a counter punch. You know, Volk um, Volkov was making him look foolish and then just hung out, like got too uh, into trying to step in with big knees and time him and actually do some hurting and got battered for it, you know, got knocked out for it. And has been wallowing in like the middle of the division ever since. But I thought Garn did a great job of um, fighting elusively, but also pushing his advantages, landing good combinations, actually hurting Derek Lewis. Because um, Derek Lewis will fall apart if you if you stand in front of you know if you make him work for five rounds or three rounds or whatever. Um, but 
to actually get stuck in and get the finish is uh, very impressive. I'm going to talk about Garden more later. Someone said Pena busting out some tricks from introduction to boxing, page one, to win the belt. Um, yeah, people asking for Pena. You know, someone said, um, someone also said Pena introducing the slip jab to women's MMA. Um, yeah, obviously, for obvious reasons, no. Might put her in the thumbnail just to tease people, but no, I'm not going to give bad boxing um, game plan of the year. Or, you know, drive up the pace or get in someone's face and be unknocked out. <laughs> this is not a great game plan. So I said uh, Piotr versus Corey. Yeah, decent. Driving up the pace. Doing what he always does, really. Uh, someone said fight Tony Ferguson. God, haven't they been trying? Everyone this year has been like, I will fight Tony Ferguson. Islam Makachev, they tried to book that fight like five times. Him versus Tony, and then him versus RDA. And you're like, we can all see what you're doing there. Um, Jeff Molina, who's in the UFC, said, game plan Gilbert Burns, uh, Wonderboy. Tempting. Uh, technical turnaround, Blond Blon Brunson. Uh, breakout technique, leg reaping off the fence. And the butt Y technique, me in my debut, scoring a 10-8 in the third, hearing the 10-second clapper, dropping my hands, pointing to the ground, and getting my shit rocked to where I don't remember re meeting Joe Rogan. <laughs> I I only vaguely remember that, but that's great to have that from the fighter's point of view. Um, Chandler versus Hooker got a couple of mentions. Again, very quick fight. Like that he got him to the fence and, and dinged him, but... Um, yeah, I'd need to see him do that a few times to know that that was the game plan, that he wasn't just going ham, which is what all he's done this year, just go ham at people. Someone said Arnold Allen versus Sadiq Youssef, which I remember being a great fight, but I don't remember a lot of the details of. Another person said Darius versus um, Diego Ferreira. Yeah, good fight, back and forth. Um, Darius's takedowns were the difference, but it was a, a close-fought thing. And you could say, that I mean, borderline, but why? Because a lot of um, Ferreira... Being on the bottom and, and losing, you know, minutes of that fight was him attacking from the bottom ineffectively. And then someone said, might sound random, but I liked Pantoja versus Cape uh, a lot. Pantoja beat someone bigger, faster, stronger, more skillful with doubling up jabs, taking control of the center, calf kicks versus stepping in, spamming front kicks and coming back with right hands. I mean, I, I wouldn't even call Manuel Cape more skillful at this point. But yeah, Manuel Cape's got a lot of physical skills that made him a scary prospect. And I thought Pantoja did an amazing job of timing him with good kicks. Um, you know, keeping the distance well, moving him around and making it very hard for Cape to comfortably open up. You know, we all went like, oh, Cape's lost his confidence, but Cape really like had a hard time getting to him. One that I didn't get suggested that I'm going to um, include now, which will again piss people off because it was a losing decision. But I thought Zhang Weili looked much better in the rematch against Rose Namunas. I thought she was doing clever things, um, waiting for the step and then timing the low kick on the uh, weighted leg. Using her wrestling, you know, training with Henry Cejudo and uh, Eric Alvarachin to employ a wrestling heavy game plan or a, a more wrestling heavy game plan. Um, yeah, I, I thought that was, again, like you don't want to get to get discouraged from doing clever things like that because you lost the decision. But that was another decision that could have gone either way. I really liked Kyla Phillips versus Song Yudong. Um, his like moving around the cage backwards and throwing high kicks and stuff. I thought that worked really well. I was very impressed by that. Sadly, he dropped off again this year after that, but I was very impressed. Um, Dan Hook is going to get a shout out later in um, the But Why, I'm sure. But I thought his performance against uh, Nazrat Hakparast was really interesting. It was a, a very, um, you know, he specifically chose to use all the elements of his game, use his wrestling, um, which you don't often see from him. You know, he used to be called the hangman because he choked a lot of people. But um, I thought that was a, because he'd had such a rough run recently at the top of the division, and then he came down to like a middle of the division sort of guy. And then but just put in one of the performances of his life there. Uh, and it was a very smart, measured performance from him too. Actually, I'm going to shout out um, Nganu versus Miocic here. Because again, it was only one fight in the year. So a lot of people were talking about Nganu for technical turnaround. But you typically like to see like a longer or, or more of um, them in action in a year than like one fight to know that they've technically turned around. Um, but I thought his performance against Steve Amiotrix was wonderful. Had, did everything he had to do, uh, changed everything he had to change, started out with bodywork and low kicks, uh, applied the jab beautifully, dealt with the wrestling expertly, you know, didn't rush in. What got him caught a lot in the first fight was rushing in to try and get quick stoppages or 
um, push his advantages too much, and he'd either get dinged on the counter later in the fight and, and wobbled, or um, Stipe would duck in and hit his hips easy in the early going. Whereas in the rematch, you know, Stipe's trying to get single legs going and is um, uh, just sprawling him out. Beautiful Sergei Kovalev uh, right-hand lead to big jab. But to take a fighter like that who is known for the big knockout and knows he can get the big knockout and is obsessed with the big knockout and make them fight or for them to choose to fight in um, attractive techniques, techniques that are going to slow the opponent down uh, and make him more hittable later, it is very encouraging. That's a, a really good sign for his future and also um, just a great game plan in that fight in particular. Because Stipe Miocic has made a fortune, well, no, not a fortune, but as close to a fortune as you can in MMA, um, fighting guys who are going to swing as hard as they can at his head and jabbing him up and ducking in on takedowns. And the moment that Nganu started uh, attacking below his neck, <laughs> anything below his neck, um, he had a ton of success. I might even give that game plan of the year. I think I will, actually. You, you know, heavyweights very rarely impress you, and I think you've got to give it up to them when you um, when they do. Actually, shout out also to Robert Whittaker versus Kelvin Gastelum. I thought that was a wonderful all-around performance, but pushed his advantages where he needed to. Uh, you saw a lot more working on the counter after leading, because you saw him against Darren Till um, and Jared Cannon here. He can get in and, and stick him with the jab or stick him with a good one, too and then maybe apply the, the head kick once a round or once every two rounds. But against Gastelum, he was sticking him, and then Gastelum would return, and um, Rob would go onto the back foot and hit him with a check hook and come back with his, uh, with his rear hand afterwards. And he used his takedowns, which we always like, against a guy who's very hard to keep down. And when Gastelum was encouraging him to pass the guard, he was like, oh, no, you've got me in flattened side, sorry, flattened uh, half guard, dead to rights. Please pass my guard. Whitaker was like, no, I'm going to stay in, side, uh, in half guard, thanks. I know that if I pass at all, you're going to your fucking hands and knees and getting up or fat man rolling me. So that actually I'm, I'm going to shout that out to as a big uh, contender for this year's. But I think I'm going to give it to Francis Ngani versus Stipe Miocic. I was just I was blown away by that. I think everyone was. It's just we got a little bit further away from it. And now people are like, mm, not that impressed anymore. So Francis Ngannou, game plan of the year. Next topic, or next award rather, um, technical turnaround. This is my baby, my favourite. Um, I To give you the history of the award, 2014 TJ Dillashaw, 2015 Rose Namajunas, 2016 Max Holloway, 20, 2017 Robert Whittaker, 2018 three-way tie Dustin Poirier, Henry Cejudo and Jan Blachowicz, 2019 Justin Gaethje. I thought I gave it to... Um, Volkan Uzdemir, and that was to my eternal shame. And I went back and read the article, and I was like, but you can't deny that it was Justin Gaethje this year. So I was very pleased to get to um, put that in, set that right. Uh, and then 2020, I gave it to Charles Oliveira, for obvious reasons. Now, the difficulty with this award, of course, is that it, it isn't clearly or, or cleanly confined to a year. Charles Oliveira was um, improving over a long period of time. And he was losing fights in the time that he was improving as well. You know, his issues with like gas tank and stuff like that. Um, finding his correct weight class because he went down to featherweight and then uh, was too big and, and uh, trying to push too high a pace and gassing out. And he went back up, was doing great work against people uh, there, you know, back at lightweight and then got stopped by Paul Felder. But, you know, if you look at him now and then you look at the Felder fight, you're like, eh, no, I think he's probably a lot better now. Um this is my baby, this award, because uh, a lot of these guys, you know, you read down that list and you're like, damn, Jack, you're just giving it to champions and um, you know, top five guys. And a lot of them weren't when they got the award. Um, Dillashaw, Nami Yunus and um, Holloway all won titles in the same year. They were the 2014, 2015 and 2016 choices. And I think they all won the title in 2017. Um, and Dillashaw and Nami Yunus won it on one night, which was awesome. Um, Obviously, Poria, Cejudo, and Blahovic, who I couldn't decide between in 2018, all went on to do great things. Justin Gaethje is still hanging around at the top of his division. Charles Oliveira is obviously the best lightweight in the world right now, even though everyone will continue betting against him. Um, 2021. Who was our guy or girl? Few recommendations for this one. Lots of people saying Jose Aldo. And while I think he's getting better, you know, I did say, like, he's looking technically better than he's looked at any point in his life. I don't know if it's that kind of level of a turnaround. He's doing a lot of the things he used to do. Um, he's added a couple of new looks, new wrinkles, but um, 
you know, I don't know if it's if it's. I I would definitely I definitely want to um mention it and and say yes, I'm really impressed with El, with what Eldo is doing. But I don't know if it's the best this year. Um, lots of people saying Chris Curtis on account of his uh, terrific run of late. He went something like zero and three in 2019 and is now on a six and zero run with two wins over very respected UFC prospects. I would have to check the old footage and see how much his his actual like game has changed, because when I see you know when I see him in the UFC winning these fights, it it just looks like a savvy old vet with a great feel for um, when openings are are there, and patience and ability to take a, a bit of a kick in. Because um, Brendan Allen and Phil Hawes were both beating him up with kicks and things until he found his mark, but he is what they'd call in the old days a cutie, really slick, clever, tricky fighter. Um, and I'll always appreciate that. You knew the moment that I, did, I compared him to Jersey Joe Walcott on uh, the podcast after, either after the um, Allen fight or the Hawes fight, that he was going to be a boy. He's going to be in contention for all the awards. Um, a few mentions of Marina Rodriguez. Uh, I don't know how much you know how much she's improved technically. Um, you know, she, she certainly had a very hard time wrestling and, and grappling with. Um, Carla Esparza, Cynthia Galvillo, uh, Randa Marcus. But on the other end of it, you know, the Michelle Waterson. Actually, Michelle Waterson's a decent wrestler and um, had a go at a few in that fight. But, you know, staying on the feet against Mackenzie Dern, not super impressive because Mackenzie Dern is the lady Brian Ortega. Her takedowns are dog shit. A couple of um, suggestions of Volkanovski, which is very bold considering he's already the world champion. Um... Actually, he was also shouted out for Game Plan of the Year by a couple of people because of the uh, more pressure-heavy approach he took in the Ortega fight. You know, you, you watch him in the Ortega fight, and he's going forward. Ortega will throw something. He'll hop back a little bit, and he'll be straight back on him. Or Ortega will try and take him down, and he'll break the clinch, and he'll be straight back on him in his face. Um, it was, yeah, it was a little bit of a change-up from what we're familiar with because these last two have been against Max Holloway, more measured technical kickboxing matches. Francis Ngannou is in here because of the Stipe fight. Again, I do like to see a little bit more than one fight. Michelle Pereira, people have suggested, I think I shouted him out last year. He was in contention, but didn't get it because obviously Charles Oliveira. Um, but yeah, he's made efforts to be still fun, but less wild. But actually looking at the dates on these fights, I was remembering the Chaos Williams one and the Nico Price one, and even the Zalim Imadeov fight, uh, which I thought he looked really good in. But... Uh, you know, all, the only fight he had this year was Nico Price in July. So uh, hard to, well, I, you know, I, I, I shouted him out last year. Hard to give him anything this year. Lots of people said Charles Oliveira for obvious reasons, but I have already given him it last year. Brunson is an interesting one. Blonde Brunson, lots of people into that for the mean value, but also for actually genuinely improving. Um, and the, the general consensus is just a little bit more measured. Because... Uh, Brunson went through a period of just fighting like an absolute moron um, from about the Sam Alvey fight, especially the Sam Alvey fight. He just realizes that he can drive in headfirst at someone's chest, keep running at them. And guys like Sam Alvey, Rowan Car uh, Carnero, um, Uriah Hall are all going to fall down against you. Uh, Robert Whittaker smoked him off that. Then he had a boring kickboxing match against Anderson Silva, which he should have won, but he lost. Um, a couple of wild performances against Dan Kelly and uh, Leo de Machida. Jacare head kicked him. Tried to bum rush Israel, uh, Israel Adesanya. Got smoked. Um, boring fight against uh, Eli Elias Theodoru. One against Ian Heinich. And then Edmund Shabazian was when we started being impressed. I remember shouting him out for this category last year because the Shabazian fight was very impressive. Um, just sort of like staying on top of his feet. I mean, the chin is never going to be, you know, stop being up there in the air at this point. I've seen footage of him training with a tennis ball under his chin, keeping it pinned to his chest. And his, his first reaction when he starts punching is still to throw his uh, head back and look at the ceiling. Um, so that's never going to be fixed probably at this point. But I did like what he was doing against Shabazian. Um, he was either the Southpaw or the Orthodox fighter, but he was an open guard max matchup. Kept throwing lovely rear leg uh, high kicks and body kicks would shoot in a, a rear hand straight and then he changed it in with his level changes really nicely used his wrestling effectively Kevin Holland well I mean his two fights this year have been Kevin Holland and Darren Till and yes impressive but also two guys who just I mean Kevin Holland can't stop a takedown and Darren Till 
can't get up off the bottom. Uh, Darren Till, you know, better takedown defense than Kevin Holland. Kevin Holland, better bo- better bottom game than Darren Till. So you saw two aspects of it, but it was just Brunson having an, an easy an easy time, basically. Uh, he still had some rough moments against Kevin Holland. I mean, he got dinged pretty hard by Darren Till in the third round because his chin's always in the fucking air. But um, I did think both those performances were impressive. And of course, he's now like in contention for a title shot. So uh, whether that's because there just aren't enough good middleweights. I mean, he's the only top wrestler at middleweight now, basically. So uh, he does provide an interesting matchup for almost anyone in the top 10 that you, you care to name. So there, you know, he gets his mention. I don't know if he's technically turned around all that much, but his um, strategic decision making has been a bit better of late or tactical decision making, whichever is correct. Some people, uh, some people shouted out Ricky Simone, particularly for learning to move his head, which, you know, I'm, I'm all in favour of. I've enjoyed Ricky Simone for a while. I loved his fight against uh, Hanny Yaya. And he's the kind of guy where he will slip a punch and do like a cool move off it, as he did against Hanny Yaya several times. But his head is like completely stationary until he wants to slip a punch. And that made him like an a absolute mark for um, someone very quick, like Uriah Faber, even at age 40. Well, I thought he looked great against Ray Borg. I thought he looked... Was that the... I'll just check that was this year. Hold on. It's all blurring together at this point. Fuck, that was May 2020. Um, but he's thought, fought three times this year. Um, submitted uh, Gentano Pirello, who I think was a last-minute replacement. But then he beat Brian Kelleher in a, a good little scrap. Uh, if you haven't seen that, go check that out again. It was a case of, like, Brian Kelleher is, is pretty tricky, but uh, Simone just looked so big against him. I mean, the size of Simone's back... He's like um, Chris Toyoni, you know, he just takes up the entire camera shot. <laughs> um, but then most recently, of course, just like two weeks ago, uh, he smoked Rafael Asuncao. Now, Asuncao's 39, but, uh, you know, last year, maybe, I probably wouldn't have picked Simone against Asuncao. You know, not the year that, well, actually, no, it was 2019 that he lost to Faber and Font, but he only had the one fight in 2020, which was Ray Borg. I mean, I, I just wouldn't have picked him against Rafael Asuncao, and he looked great in this in his last one against Asuncao. I mean, he's, he's a guy with time potential because he's beaten uh, Mirab uh, Devalishvili, you know. Um, so his strength is is very strong. You know, his his wrestling, his short level changes into quick double legs, his top game, all very strong. It was his striking letting him down, and it has looked a bit better. Now, granted, if you have a great, like, you and Ray Borg are trading body body head combinations Ray Borg's not a great striker strike in his own right but he did well against Rafael Asuncao looked good against Kelleher neither of those guys as dangerous as a Uriah Faber or Rob Font but it'll be fun you know it's bantamweight the scary scary strikers are basically the entire top 10 so he's not far off having to um, show himself off against one someone said Kutalaba for winning a decision and I almost can't argue with that <laughs> this dude's entire career has been like hyping himself up so much before the fight that he's gassed by the end of round one. But he did win a decision over Devin Clark and he also like broke all his fucking teeth in that fight. Um, I was about to say he hasn't had a great time of late, but it was 2020 that he got smoked by Ankalaev twice. Uh, in 2021, he's actually split draw with Dustin Jacoby. Mm-hmm. But that um, win over Devin Clark was very impressive. I'm not giving him it, just so you know, but... Uh, as a guy that I always laugh at, I was actually quite impressed by that Devin Clark performance. A couple of uh, suggestions for Giga Chikadze. Now, this is an interesting one because obviously he's had a very rapid explosion in popularity and success this year. But I don't know if that's down to him. I think that's down to, you know, that could be the fact that he's no longer fighting absolute bums. Um, Giga Chikadze's fucking record is hilarious. You know, his first, um, of his first three fights, he debuts against a debuting opponent. Fine. For, uh, his <laughs> second win is over a 1-10 and 10 opponent. His third win is over an 0-13 oh opponent. Um, and then everyone he fights has a losing record until... Oh, no, sorry. He fights Austin Springer on the Contender Series, who doesn't have a losing record, and beats him. Uh, and then he immediately fights CJ Baines, who is 2-31. and 31. Fucking hell. Um... You know, it's and until he got to the UFC, these were just dreadful records he was fighting. His first fight in the UFC, he uh, wins a split decision over Brandon Davis, who is decent, but was, again, 10 and 7, loses quite a lot. Um, they got him uh, Irwin Rivera, you know, that, that guy who's like half his height to fight. Um, they, they were feeding him guys for a while in the UFC, just trying to get him a stoppage, and he couldn't fucking get one. 
And then suddenly he finishes Jamie Simmons and then fights Cub Swanson, which is a big step up in competition, finishes him, fights Edson Barbosa, another big step up in competition, finishes him. So could he have done it all along? Could, was it just the, the level of competition not pushing him? Um, you again see that. There, there are fighters who struggle to finish jobbers, but against really elite level competition, they manage to get the finishes. And that can just be because if someone is clearly outmatched, they will fight like they're outmatched. Whereas if someone is elite, and certainly if you're coming up against them and you've only fought bums, they're going to be a lot more confident, or certainly they're going to be a lot more reluctant to let you push them around, and they're going to, you know, um, go hard trying to stop or trying to beat you um, in ways that guys who are like two and thirty-one are not. Well, I mean, two and thirty-one guy lost by armbar in twelve seconds. Hmm. I'm doing the strokey beard thing here. Hmm. Interesting. Gladiator challenge where all of uh, Giga Chikadze's MMA fights until his UFC career took place. So yeah, I mean, I don't want to shit on what Giga Chikadze's done this year because his, his last two fights have been fucking awesome. Swanson in um, May and Edson Barbosa in October. Oh no, August, sorry. Um, but I don't know if that's anything that he's done that's changed that. I think he's just fought better opposition. And now we care. A couple of people said Kaikara France, and one specifically said because he learned to KO people. <laughs> Which Now, I you laugh, but that is literally the most important part of fighting. Um, not just from, I mean, you know, you talk to the odd martial arts nerd. Oh, great thing I saw the other day. Some guy just going off on how Jack Slack has ruined MMA. Uh, I, I'll read you the whole thing next time, but... This guy on Reddit just being like, I don't want to get downvoted by the Jack Slack squad, but uh, Justin Gaethje versus Michael Chandler was not a great fight. Good fighters don't get hit. <laughs> it's just going on about like Dustin Poirier gets hit too much. Charles Oliveira gets hit too much. Now, Conor McGregor, like he waited two paragraphs just to reveal the Conor turn. Um, and my response was like, oh, yeah, famous brawl lover and not and uh, technique unappreciator me. But um it's true. Like, you know, in the sport of MMA and in the business of MMA, knockouts are the most important thing. It's like the currently the jiu-jitsu world is is just full of guys sharing screenshots where their opponent in an upcoming super fight has said they'll rape their child or something like that. And you're just like, what the fuck are you doing? No, Literally no one gives a shit about the um, trash talk in jiu-jitsu. Like, people think that because Gordon Ryan is obnoxious, and the most successful act in jiu-jitsu. That's the the connection. No, the connection is that Gordon Ryan is finishing high-level opponents every time out, and nobody else in jiu-jitsu is finishing at all, except like Greg Jones. Not knockouts technically, but finishes, and that that is the hinge on which Gordon Ryan's popularity rests. Or swings. Um, so Kaikara France learning to finish people, very much going to help him. I mean, that Rogerio uh, Bontorin knockout was awesome. The one where he hit him with an uppercut and Bonturin spiked himself on his own head. And the Cody Garbrandt knockout, obviously, in December. Um, that was like three weeks ago, two weeks ago. Where he backed Cody up, put pressure on him, realized Cody was reaching for him, uh, kept using the inside hand trap to shoot the right straight through, knocked him out. Lovely stuff. I mean, he looked good against Brandon Royval. It's just Brandon Royval thrives in chaotic fights where they're both getting knocked down. So yeah, Kai Kara France, actually a good shout for possible technical turnaround. Especially when you look at like his um, record since like 2017, you know, and he hasn't finished anyone in the UFC up until Bontorin. But um, going back to like March 2017, that's his last knockout before then. So if he can start finishing people, you know, it, it's, it does happen. Like uh, Lyoto Machida, like I, I think he did have like the most knockdowns in UFC history before he started picking up knockouts but he became a really world-class finisher despite spending like his entire career up to the Rashad fight people be actually know it's the Thiago Silva fight people were like this decisionator doesn't deserve a title shot in the UFC or whatever and and now he's got one of the best highlight reels possibly in MMA history so yeah I'm almost tempted by Cara France for that um award however you know Knockouts over Cody Garbrandt at this stage. It's like they're trying to set up that Sean O'Malley match now. And like, we all see what you're doing. It took like six knockouts on Cody Garbrandt's record almost back to back before you felt comfortable making this match up. 
And then someone said, well, a couple of people said Juliana Pena, and for obvious reasons, no. <laughs> Obviously no. Um, and then the other interesting one was Brandon Moreno, who I said I'd get back to. Um, yeah, I thought he looked phenomenal in... Uh, I, I thought he looked good in the first match against um, Deverson Figueredo back in December 2020. But uh, the the performance in the second fight was night and day. The confidence... It, it's like once you've been in there and... and being hit by the really big hitter. You go, oh, that, that sucks. Or, or a lot of people get like properly freaked out by it. But once you've been in there for five rounds with the big hitter and you know it was a majority draw or whatever, um, suddenly the second fight, he's just like, he obviously he's taking care. He's avoiding the punches wherever he can, but he was going after Figueredo with his hands in a way where he just didn't seem that concerned. And where I thought in the first fight, he was clipping off these punching, these counter punches and combinations where it was like, Figueredo swings, I touch him a couple of times. And, you know, if you watch like um, Julio Cesar Chavez versus um, Meldrick Taylor, a lot of Meldrick Taylor's punches look like he's rubbing a bowling ball or something. Like the punches are going like around Chavez's head. It doesn't look like they're hurting him or even moving his head that much, but he's hitting him with like four or five every time that Chavez does anything. Um, and that that was like the first fight in the second fight. Moreno's actually hitting him. And he was, you know, doing great stuff like um, jabbing to the body and then hooking off the body jab, um, mixing up his targets beautifully. I thought he just looked phenomenal in that second Figueredo fight. Uh, and I, I did say, you know, I want to see more than that one fight for a, a technical turnaround. But it was it was three good rounds and he did take him apart. You can hear that I'm I'm basically going to give this to Brandon Moreno. Yeah, that's what's happening. I'm giving it to Brandon Moreno. I'm sorry, guys. Next award, breakout technique. Now, this one's always tricky um, because it, it doesn't always work like that. You know, in a, in a 12-month period, there is not always something that's just coming to the fore. And it, in fact, it's interesting that the, the breakout technique has never actually been the Dagestani handcuff, which is like the thing that has changed in the last five years. Um, and in 2014, I, was, it was, I gave it the electric chair sweep because there were a couple of good ones in high-level competition. But uh, I've tried to be a bit more careful with that recently. 2015 was snap kicks to the body, which have become a huge deal in MMA. You know, you just watched um, Charles Oliveira stab the shit out of um, Dustin Poirier's gut with with um, kicks with the ball of the foot. 2016 was the Imanari roll because there were a couple of high-level ones again. But uh, yeah, it's... it's. Well, I mean, Brian... Sorry, Ryan, Brian Hall. Ryan Hall's just had a, a successful performance wherein he, he Imanari rolled a few times. Um, 2017 was a little bit more serious. The anaconda choke and front headlock fluidity. That was because of the effect of people like um, Tony Ferguson, Brian Ortega, and um, Vicente Luke. Really includes like the DAS, the go-behinds, all the stuff that you, you are seeing guys get murdered with now. It's, it's certainly becoming a, a bigger deal in um, high-level jiu-jitsu too, the, the front headlock position and the threat of go-behinds from there. 2018 was the Sulo of stretch because two were hit in one night, and obviously it's never become an issue since. Um, it, it's a weird one, the Sulo of stretch, because it only really exists in MMA because guys four point so much or quad pod. Uh, guys are getting more into it in jiu jitsu. But I will say, Andre Muniz scored another armbar this year. Well, he scored two this year um, Ronaldo Souza, Jacare, and Eric Anders, um, both over the back armbars and against uh, Anders, at least. Anders got up in the quad pod and, or, you know, tripoding up or whatever you want to call it. And um, Muniz was on his back and he reached for the leg as if to do the Sulo F stretch and um, pulled himself over into the arm bar uh, with an overhook. It was very cool. He, he does that, or he's done that twice. And it's well worth looking at. The Sulo F stretch is is getting caught in a like an off-balancing technique, but letting them get too far into it. Um, 2019, none awarded, obviously. 2020, turning the rear straight into a jab, or brackets the Poirier shift, which was getting huge with, um, you know, everyone was doing it. Corey Sanhagen, Justin Janes, uh, Gavin Tucker, they were both doing it to each other in the same fight. Um, what I mean by the Poirier shift is if you are South Port, actually, we'll say if you're orthodox, because most people are, you throw a right straight, you step through into uh, South Port, and double the right straight so that it's a jab now. So right straight step jab, and then you throw the left hand. And uh, James and Gavin Tucker both had fun throwing the, the left hand as the upper or the rear hand as the uppercut. Um, Dustin Poirier has obviously made a great uh, career for himself basically by throwing from uh, southpaw left straight 
step through left jab, right overhand. Uh, he's a southpaw, but his best punch is the overhand right, which he lands orthodox. There isn't always a good answer. Um, I thought last year's was actually pretty good because so many guys were using it. Um, but here's what uh, people on Twitter had to say. One, checking calf kicks. Lots of people suggested this. I've still only see a few, seen a few people do it. Um, I think, crucially, Juliana Pena did it against Amanda Nunes, which is a big deal because no one's fucking checking calf kicks. Um, she did the Aldo hinge at the knee, draw the foot back to the opposite knee so that the kick slides underneath. And I think, you know, as sloppy and shitty as that fight was, I think it was very important to her getting into the fight because the first calf kick that um, because the first calf kick that Amanda Nunes threw, she dropped uh, Pena. And if Amanda Nunes had been able to get out of that by just calf kicking, get out of being punched in the face with awful slip jabs and awful, uh, you know, right elbow out to the side punches, um, she would have. But she'd missed a couple of calf kicks, so she didn't go back to it, which was, you know, important. But that uh, Aldo anti-calf kick Filthy Casuals guy did amazing numbers this year. I think we were up to 600,000 views on that, which is just crazy. Um, because people are interested in how to stop the calf kick, and it is not something that many people are doing in MMA. But it's still like Aldo, Gaethje once, Stephen Thompson a couple of times. There's not an awful lot of guys who, you know, if you fight Jose Aldo and you try and calf kick him, you're probably in for a bad time. You wouldn't say that about anyone else in the sport right now. Even the very famous, like, lots of people were giving me the example. They were like, oh, is this the year that the calf kick comes undone? Uh, you had the Uriah Hall, Chris Weidman break and the Conor McGregor versus Dustin Poirier break. The Conor McGregor versus Dustin Poirier break, it's still kind of vague. Well, like, we haven't actually worked. I uh, you know, I've seen people. I don't want to say no one's worked out what it was because people will link me the Weasel's d video where he debunks it or something. But it was pretty unclear what happened there to break his shin. It was it, it looked like it got, uh, you know, partially broken earlier in the fight and then he kicked an elbow or something. But the Hall versus Weidman one, that was, I mean, he was just trying to do what Jimmy Rivera tried and failed to do a hundred times against Pedro Munoz, which was step out into the kick. And that almost never works because when you step out into the kick, you're, it, it takes you a moment to get there and put your weight down. So you end up falling all over the place most of the time. I mean, if you watch the Wyman one, he takes it basically on the top and side of his uh, shin and he's completely off balance when the kick lands as well. Like It, it was freakish that the, the shin broke and he was clearly trying to check it, but it, I would not have called it a great check. Lots of people suggesting Don Tell Mays for uh, his uh, humping of the head. Turns out you can smash someone with your cup and it's completely legal. Um, it, it was quite an interesting thing. I, I think it was called Punishing Rides. It was a Josh Barnett DVD from way back in the day. I think they did it on Scientific Wrestling. Shout out Scientific Wrestling, friends of the podcast. Um, but one of them, he was doing like north-south and he was like, put the inside of your thigh over their face. <laughs> you know, like proper almost teabag of the dude. Um, but jo yeah, Josh Barnett was all for like smashing dudes with your faces, with your hips, cup, thigh. Um, it, it was certainly, I mean, not as a strike, that was interesting, but, um, it, I, it, it's really just what you're willing to do without embarrassment. <laughs> um, someone said the slip jab in WMMA, like WMMA is basically a different sport at this point. We're not, we're not going to include techniques that only work there. Um, effective stunt switching and shoulder rolling, someone said, but that's basically last year. Uh, and then another person said the low single. Which I'm tempted to give it to, because the um, uh, Satoshi won two fights wherein he used low singles this year. Um, Matuj Gamrot won three fights wherein he used the low single this year. Uh, the classic, like, Sakuraba-style low single. Habib left, but he, he used them against um, Justin Gaethje and uh, Michael Johnson, I think. Um, so, yeah, tempting. Um, other people said left hook. Uh, and any form of bodywork. The left hook, I was talking about this all year. I was saying I think that's the next big thing to catch on good counter left hooks. Because as guys get more confident boxing and throw the right hand more, the right straight more, uh, the left hook is there. And Vicente Luke's been killing people with it forever, the counter left hook this is. Um, Armin Sarukin scored an amazing one this year. There's been loads coming out from like the Russian scene. If you look at Kaposa's feed on any given night, there's like two counter left hook knockouts. Someone said Khalil Roundtree for actually landing a fight-ending low-line sidekick, something which has been feared for 10 years and happened once. Um, yeah, I mean, that was weird, wasn't it? 
Someone said breakout technique, disguising podcasting as commentary, and then put a clip of uh, Seymour Skinner going delightfully devilish. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine I'm going to stop laying into uh, the commentary teams in the ne- in the new year. Um, it, it's just like Big John, I can forgive because he's a hundred years old and he might be having a stroke anytime he does it, but. Daniel Cormier is clearly just covering for not knowing or caring. He's like, well, why would I watch the fight when I can talk about some bollocks? Someone said that weird behind the leg thing Manel Cape did. I think he means a Rabona, which uh, was already used effectively last year or no, two years ago by um, Ricardo Ramos. No, it wasn't. It was it was used. It was He did it a hundred times in a fight and then got knocked out um, and then went back to fighting like he normally does and got back in the winning column again. Um the one adv- example of a good Rabona actually doing something I've seen, Yaya Rodriguez um, did it to Dan Hooker, did the Rabona and then spun into an elbow off it and hit him with the elbow. It was, it was awesome. The Rabona should be used like people use the inside thigh slap. You know, like um, when uh, Schlemenko beat the shit out of uh, Gegard Musasi on the regional scene, he was doing just like slap the inside of uh, Musasi's lead leg with his hand. Musashi would go, oh no, he's trying to take me down, and then he hit him with the overhand instead. <laughs> or Jones would do it into the elbow. That's how you should be using the Rabona. It's a touch, and it puts you in position to do something else. If you're going to use the Rabona, ideally, don't use the Rabona at all. I'm just saying if you've got to use the Rabona. Actually, on the subject of Yair Rodriguez, he's not going to get a, uh, a word in in any of the other categories because they're just you know quite narrow in their scope. But I'm not going to give him like technical turnaround or best game plan or anything, but... He he did something similar to um, Giga Chikadze, where in his biggest fight yet against Max Holloway, who's a very savvy fighter, very clever fighter, very skilled all round fighter, and Yaya Rodriguez did a, it gave an amazing account of himself in that fight. I thought, and I say that as someone who's been extremely skeptical of him and um, has made fun of him a lot. <laughs> so good for him. Doesn't get an award, but I just wanted to give him a shout out. Someone said the mounted crucifix in WMMA, which we said, actually. I mean, Carlos Barza did it. Um, Valentina Shevchenko has been doing it. But we said that it's a good technique for WMMA because if there's one thing that you're not going to have in WMMA, it's, it's a lot of hitting power, especially just upper body stuff. So ground and pound, probably not going to be great here. It's not like when you watch Fedor throw an arm punch and it, it misses and hits the mat and almost goes through the ring. You know, that dude could punch without any body movement and still just wreck people. Um, that's a bit rarer in lower weight classes, and it's much rarer in women's MMA. Um, but the great thing about the, the mounted crucifix is that, firstly, elbows are a cutting technique. Um, they have value beyond the specific percussive impact that they're, they're, you know, you could hit someone with some really nice elbows, or you, actually you could hit someone with missing, gl- glancing elbows, not hurt them at all, but open up like a ghoulish cut on their brow. And you could be like, oh, cuts, they don't mean anything, blah, blah, blah. But the point of the cut, I mean, in Muay Thai, you can get a stoppage from the cut, yeah. But the point of cuts generally and the point of jabbing cumulatively in boxing is to um, create blind spots. And if you're blinking blood out of your left eye, I have a lot better chance of scoring my right straight on you than I would if you're completely composed looking at me and we're in a, a fair firefight. So the matter of fix is, is good for that because you can land elbows and, and cut people open. but also. It is a specific exploitation of the rules. The rule is you have to intelligently defend yourself. You cannot intelligently defend yourself if your hands are pinned away from your head and the guy's dropping elbows on you from a completely static position. And getting out of a mounted crucifix requires like, because they're so far from your hips, if you're going to buck your hips or try and turn or anything like that, it takes big movements to do. So yeah, I'd love to see more of that in WMMA, but again, probably not breakout technique of the year. And then someone said failed buggy uh, buggy chokes. Now, Tony versus um, Charles Oliveira was last year, unfortunately. But um, Yan Chan Nan, fucking hell, uh, against Carla Esparza, she came in looking like she had no preparation whatsoever to deal with the wrestling, which is the entire Esparza game. Uh, did no wall walking, never. She'd like get taken down in open space, but three feet from the wall. And she wouldn't move towards it. And she's there, like laying there in side control sometimes, just trying to throw an arm over the head and squeeze. And it's like Tony against Charles, you know. All you're doing most of the time is locking yourself to the opponent. The buggy choke works as a specific trap. So the, the more you try it in a, in a match, the less it's going to work. 
Now, that's not to say that it doesn't work. I believe that there is definitely space for it to work within MMA. Um, the Ruotolo twins are the guys to look at for how it works in grappling. Um, Kai Ruotolo, hang on, Cade and Ty, or Tade and Kai, no, Cade and Ty. Um, Ty Ruotolo had a great match with Craig Jones this year, you know, one of the number one, one of the top two or three pound for pound grapplers in the world right now. And Ty Ruotolo is smaller than him too. Uh, and Ty Ruotolo almost got him with a buggy choke at one point. And then later, later in the match, um, Craig passed his guard. Ty started threatening the buggy choke again, and Ka uh, and um, Craig went back into half guard by choice to avoid being buggy choked or threatened with the buggy choke. Meanwhile, Cade Rotolo has been doing it by... He grabbed a front headlock on a guy from top position and rolled off him like, oh no, I failed, and then slapped the buggy choke on as the guy came up. You really need the guy pushing into you, um, like he's going to try and get an arm triangle or something like that. And then you also qu need quite long legs and arms to, to pull it off, mostly. And healthy shoulders, because you can end up like americana in yourself. Um, but yeah, like, uh, and Yan Chan Nan almost straight arm locked herself over Carla Esparza's back by trying the buggy choke. Um, the thing about the buggy choke is that it locks you to the other guy, because in MMA and in jiu-jitsu, jiu and any time you want to get off the bottom, you want, uh, you want to be as smooth as possible. Smooth as a whippet. Smooth as a twink. You want like no jutting out points because those are the points that people get underhooks on and just force you back to the mat. Uh, you want your elbows inside. You want your knees close to you. You know, you want, you want to be like a ball, ideally. Whereas in the buggy choke and stuff, you're throwing your arms over the guy's back and locking yourself in place. And there are instances where throwing your arms over the guy's back or headlock him or whatever are, are good and workable, but they're exceptions more than they are like, I mean, they're still like principally, you should probably stick to keeping frames and, trying to work your way out methodically. So anyway, I'm going to give the uh, breakout technique of the year to the low singles because Matoji Gamrot and um, Roberto Satoshi are dope. Final category, the butt wire award for piss poor fight IQ. And boy, do we have some bangers for you. Someone said Kevin Holland uh, for taking short notice fights versus wrestlers. <laughs> Not really like fight IQ, but yeah, I mean, eh, you know, he gets paid all the same. And he's a fan favourite. They'll pay him to save these dog shit cards. A billion mentions of Yan versus Aljo, as in Aljamain Sterling. Um, yes. Hang on, let me just check that that was this year. Yeah, that was March. In which case, oh God, that feels a long time ago. But in which case, 100%. Um, imagine being the fucking world champion in an organisation and either not knowing the rules or just being willing to forget them to try and knee a guy in the head. Whether you think he was... Uh, I mean, you know, the the argument seems to be like, oh, he didn't know it was a foul. And then you're like, well, he's a fucking idiot then. Um, this guy who's got elite level awareness in every other position in the game was just like, oh, I thought I could knee him on the ground. And he's done it before. Like he did it against um, Magomed Magomedov. That's how he lost the fucking fight by headbutting the guy, getting warned and then headbutting him later in the fifth round and being like, oh, I thought you, I could get away with it. And he watched the Yarn fanboys and their their argument is like, well, he should, the ref should have gone easier on him. He should have given him another warning. You know? And you're like, no, I'm never... Like, if you foul a guy for the first time and the ref takes a point, I'm absolutely fine with that. In this case, he'd fouled him like two or three times and the ref took the point. But, like, you don't get a set number of gimmies from a referee just because you have, like, plausible deniability. And to be honest, the, the Aljo one, he was dead to rights. It was clear what he was trying to do. It was clearly illegal. And... Um, yeah, brain fart of the year to pull that one off. Nate laughing at Leon. A lot of people said that. Let me just say, like, I think Nate Diaz got more out of not pursuing the stoppage there than he than he would have pursuing the stoppage. Um, like, that was his moment. That's all he needed. That big moral victory from a five-round arse kicking. Connor punting Dustin's knee in the third with an injured leg, possibly. Someone said Spike Carlisle for all categories. <laughs> I think that was a, a year ago at least now that he did the Billy Quarantilo thing. I think Spike Carlisle's been gone for a while and I'm a poet and I surely knew it. Um, oh no, he fought... Fuck. Oh no, 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 no. no. He, he was, his last fight was Bill Algio in um, November 2020 and then he's been on the... He's been knocking around other places since Cage Warriors, Bellator... He's a disaster waiting for it to happen because he's a super religious man who keeps tweeting about, like, the Jews. <laughs> um, 
Uh, or super Catholic man who keeps treating about the Jews or, Jews or whatever. Um, someone said Lifetime Award, Tyron Woodley. I mean, he's not fought in MMA this year, has he? Oh, no, did he fight to, um, Vicente Luke? Which was a brave performance, if a stupid one. Someone said Chris Moutinho. I'm not sure what Chris Moutinho was supposed to do. I mean, he did... Uh, yeah, you don't want to get hit in the head a thousand times. Because, you know, martial arts is about not getting hit, as that dude said. But it's a fist fight. You're trying to win. If you don't have any other um, qualities where you're winning, toughness is, is legitimate. And Sean O'Malley breaks his hands and feet every single time out. So, yeah, absolutely walk him down and try and take his punches. Um, Amanda Nunes. I mean, you know, what, what do you say about Amanda Nunes? Like someone got in her face and she broke. Like that's not a, a fight IQ thing. Um, there's, there's other things to be said, like she did have a really bad bout of COVID. She could have had um, lingering effects from that. I think we've all sort of written that off as like, no, nah, it doesn't happen because Volkanovski looked so good. Um, but it, yeah, there's still big questions over like, it, it's an individual thing. There are going to be like, just because one guy didn't get fucked up by it in the long run, someone else might, you know, it's a, um, might be a bit unfair to like, just say, well, the man was clearly... Uh, you know, it was it was bad fight IQ and she just was lazy and didn't come in in shape. With that being said, you know, she she was broken and she did quit with like an arm wrapped over her face and not a choke uh, and no hooks in. But I don't know if I'd say that's bad fight IQ. I'd say that just like running in. Maybe she over, overlooked Pena. Uh, who wouldn't? She's like never won two fights back to back before this. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that's bad fight IQ. Someone said Dern versus Rodriguez. A few people said Dern versus Rodriguez. I mean, well, what's she going to do? She's got awful takedowns. Um, other people said Ortega versus Volkanovski. Again, what's he going to do? He's got awful takedowns. Lewis versus Garn. What's he going to do? He's got awful striking and he waits for his opportunities. Phillips versus Piva. I don't even remember. Hall versus Tapuria. Yeah, I mean, he did uh, allegedly break his hand very early. And Tapuria is such a strong wrestler. You know, you're not going to try and take him down. So you might as well try some rolling bollocks. Jean Anne versus Esparza, 100%. Coming in and not trying to wall walk is insane in 2021. What the fuck? Throwing naked pe uh, full power low kicks with a micro fractured tibia. Few people have said that. Um, do does Herb Dean fall under the butt? Why? No, but, you know, just make sure that you know he's shit. Just end of the year. Got to say it again. Um, someone said John Kavanagh and Johnny Walker. I was surprised how few people said Johnny Walker for um, the butt. Why? Um... Very strange performance. I mean, obviously, what they're trying to do with him is to try and get him to be a little bit more measured with his power and his uh, physical abilities. Problem is that, like, he never got going against Tiago Santos. Um, and, and they were just saying, like, perfect fainting, keep fainting. And you're like, no, you've got you to fucking do something with the feints. Otherwise, all that happens is you're fainting and the guy is either reacting and you're not, ta not taking advantage of it. Of it. Um, oh, let's try that again. You're fainting, he's reacting, and you're not taking advantage of it. Or you're fainting and he's not reacting, and then your fainting has come to naught, you know? The moment someone stops reacting to your feints, you're supposed to blast them. Because otherwise it does nothing. You're not benefiting from fainting in any way. But to be like round after round, perfect, keep fainting, just really strange corner work. However, hang on, I can't remember if he won or lost that fight because it was close and boring. Hold on, hold on. Oh, no, he did lose that, so yeah, fuck him. Uh... <laughs> But, but I mean, you know, he was on a uh, a one and two run. He'd had his whole thing derailed. Uh, Corey Anderson, Nikita Krilov, he looked so bad. I mean, the Corey Anderson one, he got smoked quickly. And everyone was like, oh, yeah, that's what happens when you meet like an elite fighter. And then you're like, no, it's not really. It's light heavyweight. They're all bad and hit really hard. Um, but the Nikita Krilov one was a straight up embarrassing fight for both of them. They're just rolling all over the place, gassed in one round, going for three. Um so, yeah, I mean, I can understand trying to get him towards a more technical game. But, yeah, it was a, a dog shit game plan. Cody Garbrandt was mentioned about a thousand times. I mean, he just, like, his thing was speed and power. And there are guys with good jabs and feints now who mitigate that entirely. Oh, Justin James shooting on Charles, uh, uh, Charles Roser in the last round. Yeah, that was a pretty great one. But it was even made even better by the fact that James had bet his full purse on himself. Uh, did Priscilla Cachoeira think... Uh, it was a good idea to try and get a woman's eye on live TV. That was insane. Genuinely insane. Because at least with um, Li Jingliang, which we all know was flagrant eye gouging. 
But at least he had sort of plausible deniability because his head was in the hole. He was reaching up over his own head. He couldn't see shit. I mean, yes, Priscilla Cachoeira was reaching back. But with Li Jingliang, he was just like uh, frantically pushing off the guy's face. Even if he wasn't trying to get the eyes, which he was. Even if he wasn't trying to get the eyes, that's what he'd be doing, like pushing the guy's face off. Um, with the Cachoeira one, she literally reaches back and feels around several times. And Gillian, um, Gillian Robertson moved her head like three or four times. And I can't get, I again cannot say enough how classy it was of uh, Gillian Robertson to basically ignore it when she was asked about it post fight to just be like, oh, well, you know, I was hoping the referee would stop it or whatever. Because um, I think from that position, from, from like even the Li Jing Liang one, if you intentionally gouge an eye to get out of a choke, or if you gouge, if you gouge an eye to get out of a choke and it's accidental, which it never is, that's a submission. And that should go down as a submission. That should be a technical submission, like when the arm breaks and the ref stops it just because the fighter won't tap. Someone said Aspen Ladd, and I presume just the state of her career at the moment. Blades versus Lewis. A few people said this because, you know, he was doing so well on the feet. He was using the low kicks so effectively. He was punching him up in combinations. He was fainting to draw the counter uppercut or to draw the counters and to throw him off. And then he still dived onto the uppercut, um, which, yeah, I mean, I feel like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to, to not be like reaching for snatch singles and uh, high crotches and things like that against someone who you're so much better at wrestling than. Is that the way to say that? I mean, you know, like I said it with um, Miocic versus Stipe. Sorry, Miocic, well, Miocic versus Nganu. I said it before the fight. I was like, you know, with a guy like that size, you've got to be going for takedowns where if they, you, you know, you're not going to get sprawled out and stuck on the bottom. Uh, and high crotches are great for that. You know, just picking up a single leg with your head on the outside and treating it as a single leg. Um, which you don't see an awful lot in wrestling, like pure wrestling or jiu-jitsu. But in MMA, you'll see guys like Habib do it all the time, Daniel Cormier, because it, it puts your head on the outside. You're not going to get counter uppercut id. Um, or certainly it's a lot harder to be. Uh, whereas level changing into the guy's hips, that will get you uppercutted. Or sprawled on, you know. Um, anyway, Cody doing a Barboza impression. <laughs> Colby trying to be an outside fight. I thought Colby did fine in the rematch. You know, a lot of people were like, oh, Colby, you blew it. But I thought he was okay. Yeah. Um, Dustin rolling out of the omoplata. A few people said that. I could be tempted to give this to him, to be honest. Um, I mean, it, yeah, he's an experienced fighter. He'll know if he can stand and posture out of it. Uh, and he he chose to go into a role there. I mean, people get mad about the glove grab, but he was asked about it. He said he didn't feel a glove grab. And I feel like... An experienced fighter would feel the glove grab, um, like the Danny Gay one, which was hilarious. But wherever you fall on it, like landing in the middle of the ring did not work out well for him. And he said it himself, like he couldn't, there wasn't too much room between him and the cage. If you watch him against um, Habib, and I did say like, you know, before the fight, I was like, I don't think this is going to play out well for Dustin because his answer to being taken down is to get on his hands and butt and scoot back to the fence. Um, the a ATT walk system sort of thing, but that is his game. And he was uh, taken down so far away from the fence that there was no chance he was going to get up to his hands and scoot back to it. Well, not taken down, sorry, he rolled into the, the sweep so far from the fence. So he just ended up getting on the bottom, getting elbowed. Um, and yeah, I mean, it didn't look like he was using that much energy, but it, holding a guy as strong as Oliveira uh, and trying to stop him from elbowing you is, is hard work. And he did it for a full round. And got finished in the next one. And then to flip it, someone said Connor guillotine on Dustin. I mean, it didn't ultimately cost him quite as badly as that omoplata roll. Um, but, you know, anytime you're jumping to bottom position, not great. Um, just anyone jumping guillotine. There was a fight between Patchy Mix and James Gallagher this year. And both of them were just jumping on front headlocks and pulling guard. And eventually Patchy Mix won, but by James Gallagher just gassing. Um, and everyone was like, well, that proves that Patrick Mix is legit. James Gallagher is not. And I was like, no, both of these guys get their shit pushed in if they try that against good wrestlers. Um, in the UFC, at least, uh, I imagine. Anyway, uh, someone said Pedro not kicking the legs versus Dom. So lots of people said Pedro versus Dom, Pedro versus Aldo. And I would agree. Um, Pedro Minos has a style and he will not change it. And as soon as people, as soon as it's like we reach a tipping point and more people can check or evade calf kicks than can't, his career is going to go on the skids. He's going to be like a very middle middle of the pack fighter. Um, you know, that Jimmy Rivera fight, Jimmy Rivera is trying to step in on him like um, Hall versus Weidman. Uh, and he's just getting blasted every time. He's falling over himself. 
But against Aldo, who can check a low kick and, and doesn't have a problem with it, uh, Pedro never came up with anything further as an idea. Had some success with the inside low kick um, and had some success by faking the low kick and throwing the right hand, but he did it like twice. But then to come into a, a fight against Dominic Cruz and try and like naked low kick him is just like really bad uh, awareness of what you're dealing with. Dominic Cruz, you can low kick him, you can hurt him with low kicks, but you have to move him back to the fence, get him on the train tracks, um, circling side to side, and then kick him. You know, Henry Cejudo gave the blueprint to this. But guys like, uh, I mean, TJ Dillashaw did it. Guys trying to kick him in the leg out in the open, he will grab the leg and take you down so that you don't kick him again. And then people will be like, leg kicks have never worked against Dom Cruz. <laughs> um, so Pedro's game plan for that fight was, was dreadful. Um, so I said Jamal Emmer's going for a leg lock against Pat Sabatani. I can't even remember that one. Crook versus Smith. Um, on account of Crook not grappling in round one and then successfully getting a takedown on one leg in round two. <laughs> I mean, you know, Anthony Smith's good off his back. So maybe he was, you know, you're not going to judge a guy for trying to feel it out and then getting caught quickly. Um, so I said Paulo Costa, just his whole year. I thought he looked good when he got back in the cage. It's just like insane uh, levels of unprofessionalism to miss weight by such a huge amount. However, he did tell them well in advance and get the fight moved to a different weight, which I think is a lot better than turning up on the day, having clearly not tried to cut weight and being like, please fight me or we don't get paid. Someone said, Li Jingliang squaring up and throwing the hardest right hand of his life two seconds into his fight with Kamzat. Yes, 100%. Terrible. Why would you come out against a guy who's going to try and wrestle you and throw a straight right off the bat? But then that's Li Jingliang. He's not very smart. Why did? But why is uh, Joe Rogan giving Connor the mic? Yeah, um, Dan Ige in every fight. Yeah, Tim Elliott stalling from the bottom instead of trying to scramble up in the third round of a competitive fight. Oh God, I remember that. Yeah, that was the one where James Krause was like, "You got this in the bag, baby," and he's just there losing this last round, doing nothing. God, that was awful. Um, someone said Sylvester. Oh, this is a brilliant one. Uh, we didn't have enough non-UFC fights in this year, but Sylvester Miller. In Cage Warriors 121, I talked about this on the podcast. The guy, he's this weird little orc guy who's about four feet tall, but he's getting top position. He's in closed guard and he keeps like posturing up and dropping elbows, but dropping his head with it and headbutting the guy. And you're like, damn, that's a that's a savvy move. But then the ref called him on it and said, I'm going to take a point. And then he did it again. And he took the point. And I think he took two points before disqualifying him. But the guy kept doing it. He was just... And every time he'd get up and go like, oh, no, you're like, how? How have you drilled it into muscle memory to cheat? <laughs> like The cheat is something clever you do when you've got the chance. Like, don't get it to the point where you literally can't stop doing it. Just a very silly fighter and a very silly way. I mean, that, I think that was a world title fight as well or a Cage Warriors title fight. And then someone said, but why Chandler slamming himself with um, Oliver on his back? Uh, and Chandler letting Gaethje punch him in the face and stumbling about spitting blood. Basically Chandler's whole year. Uh, I will say, yeah, on the Oliver on his back and then trying to slam him. It does resonate with judges. It can wind guys. I mean, it could really fucking hurt people landing on you like that. You watch um, Rico Rodriguez do it to Marcelo Garcia in ADCC. And ADCC slam rules are fucked up anyway. Because if you're in a submission, you can slam out. Which is the only elite level thing that Gio Martinez has done in the last few years, slammed out of a Jeff Glover triangle. But Marcelo got on Rico Rodriguez's back. Rico Rodriguez was like 300 pounds at the time. Wasn't threatening a choke yet, and Rico Rodriguez just jumped on him. And they had to stop the match, you know, because he just smashed into him. Obviously, you're also not allowed to wear cups in a jiu-jitsu competition because you could stretch an arm bar over it. Um, so, yeah, good chance that his back just smashed uh, Marcelo in... Marcelo's balls between Marcelo, the floor, and Rico Rodriguez. However, you know, it, you do then end up with the guy on your back, and the, Chandler did not outweigh um, Oliveira by anything. So it was a very strange decision to make. And I think it gave Oliveira time to buy, you know, to uh, keep, regain his senses and get back in control of the fight. But I think I'm going to give it to Sylvester Miller at Cage Warriors 1 2 1. If you've not seen it, it's absolutely hilarious. Please do watch that. And I reckon that rounds us out for this week uh, and this year, I suppose. But now it's the new year. Um, I'm going to be back on Thursday. I think I might do because there's not a lot going on. So I think I might do another film room. Uh, it's been a while since we've done one of those. Uh, but I will be back on Wednesday, Thursday for the boys. 
And um, yeah, I just want to say thanks for supporting me this year, for making it such a fun year. And hopefully we get some more wild shit going on in 2021. If you want to support the podcast, get in all the extra stuff we do for the boys. Uh, read the Canelo Advanced Striking 2.0, which was uh, put out uh, about a week ago and is banging, I might add. Um, sign up to the Patreon. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I'm your boy, Jack Slack. Wine Mum Boxing is Breakout Technique of the Year. Bless.